it was cool in theory. It's an astronaut dropping a hammer and a feather on the moon to test Galileo's uh, theory that they would drop at the same speed in uh, with no atmosphere. It's just neat that they did that. And the hammer falls slightly slower than it seems like it should. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny that they were like, hey, we're going to be in a vacuum. <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> totally. Let's replicate a bunch of theoretical experiments we've read about since we were children. Right. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> epic. Can you imagine how Galileo would feel if he could see that video? Like, By the way, Holy you shit, inspired you guys us to, to go to the moon <laughs> and drop some stuff. We went stuff. to the moon for you, man. Hey, everybody. It's Zen Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. Uh, welcome back for another hang thanks yeah. for coming out special thanks as always to our patreon backers throw us as little as a buck an episode to help lighten the load on this thing um and they're also the ones that give us a lot of our feedback that we use to improve this thing so thank you we're honored <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you for coming over do you think it's true that like uh, I've I've read that when people are like, of course, as an answer, they're probably lying. <laughs> I've become very aware of that when I do things like that intro where I'm like, interesting. Oh, what were you just lying me. about to our listeners? I don't remember. Mm. Thanks. I think I just said thanks in a funny voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, is that going to be taken in sincerely? Do I need to look them in the eye and go, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming over. Either way, thanks a lot. Uh, if you can't tell yet, this is going to be a longer episode. <laughs> <laughs> Begin ramble. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing. I'm doing good. I feel like we should apologize for our collective voices. Although we live in separate cities, we seem to have had the same like Southern California cold that just wrecked me for two weeks. We must both have a computer virus. Wow! 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 That is a funny thing about those like. Imagine if real imagine if real viruses like the common cold could be sent through email. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> the human race would stop doing things. Sure over. <laughs> well, they will as soon as we all have molecular printers. Which uh if you want to hear more about what uh, you know the possible implications of, I think we have an episode where we talked about Do we? the possibility of molecular printers and drugs and viruses. Probably. Seems to be anyway, so apologies for what sniffing I am unable to cut out and what coughing I am unable to cut out. I'll do my best to clean mm, this up. Likewise. Mm, likewise. No, <laughs> they'll, just, they'll just come out of my editing machine all sexy. Do you not have a remove cough button? <sighs> no, unfortunately. What about remove snort? There's a remove fart button, but snorts and coughs don't seem <sighs> objectionable enough that they're built into the soundboard. Damn. Is there really a remove <laughs> fart button? Okay, so That's what are we joke. talking? What are we talking about this week? Leave them hanging. Leave them hanging. Uh, well, we were trying to recover from a lot of uh, dense, uh, frustrating topics that we've tried to cover recently, where we've layered on, where we've put on our own shoulders the weight of the world, uh, which is unreasonable. And not what we want to do or what our listeners want to listen to. So, I believe as we were discussing topics yesterday, I wrote something along the lines of, fuck it, let's just talk about planets. There's absolutely <laughs> nothing we don't both love about planets. <laughs> Which is so, it's, uh, well, I think it started from maybe a Hit List episode where we were talking about the uh, the new planets that they found in some other, uh, the oh, Trappist trappist planets i forget what they're called we should look that up real quick so we can and i liked that so you probably have already heard it so we're not going to go back into that jag but what we i think what we talked about was the implications of a solar system where the planets are so close together that you can actually see what people are doing on the other planet if you had a telescope so like imagine if the first time we looked at the moon it was like oh shit there's a city there they're waving at us <laughs> pretty tight pretty right? tight uh, but we realized there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about in just planets. So like, so, uh, let's back it way up. What's a planet? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are both standing on one right now. That's part of why I think they're so important to planet us. earth. <laughs> I think we hear a lot about it in the news these days. Uh, 
It's just a chunk of rock. It's just it's just a big just a big chunk of rock and metal and uh, other stuff that we don't know necessarily what it is going on. But give me more than that. Like how did that how did that chunk of rock end up as a chunk of rock? We talked about this in our very first episode. We talked about stellar nucleosynthesis, right? Wow. How do we get from stars spitting out like elements to this 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 giant rock that we're standing on well, doing things on? Everything out in space seems to be well, first of all, caveats. We don't really know. We don't know where planets <laughs> came from. They're super old. They've been around forever. That's like being that's like asking grandpa what things were like when he was a kid he doesn't remember <laughs> it was really long ago but at this point we've spent thousands of years thinking about it in some capacity right like people have been looking at the moon and oh, going i wonder what so that is it's right? amazing right it's a thing <laughs> floating out there or it's just this it's just this thing we see it's not floating or anything before right. we knew what it was it was just this this bright thing that showed up that wolves would howl at <laughs> right i mean what like the hell? wolves would howl at it which makes it seem like it's probably of some significance and then you know so like the early interaction with celestial bodies was to make up stories about them oh that's the dragon doing the something or other <laughs> or that's this guy riding his chariot or like but that well, still counts as thinking about it, right? People were looking at it, looking at it, and going, "Wow, what is that?" It, it was. It's deeper <laughs> than that. So yesterday, when we decided we were going to do planets, I started reading the Wikipedia articles on planets in general, and then specific planets and whatnot. And uh, I discovered that the earliest known, like, scientific writings about the planets. Not just are, reference, but like scientific, like someone was yeah, like, like looking at them, trying to data. figure out what they are, trying right. to predict where they'll be and when and doing it fairly successfully. So was, data analysis. Yeah. Early data analysis was the Babylonians 2000 years BCE, and they were writing it on their clay cuneiform tablets. And so basically what I realized was we have been scientifically observing and analyzing the motion of the planets uh since the beginning of writing since the beginning of of time where we can say definitively that people were doing that so probably for thousands of years before that we were talking about them we're like hey you think the moon's gonna be up tonight in an hour or in an hour and a half right well, it's if you want to chase it even deeper than that, like it matters on a level that's built into our cells, like and and is represented in the way that we conceive of time. Like a day is a day because it's the revolution on a planet. of the earth around the sun yeah. and the tides happen because of the moon and the tides affect geology and like our planet is literally shaped by its place in the solar system, right? So it's 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 ridiculous to think that we exist outside of that system, right? Right. So forget even thinking about it actively and collecting data. Like plants grow by obeying that system. Yeah, and I <laughs> I think that you get grumpy the... if you don't get enough sunlight. It's called seasonal affective disorder. Right. <laughs> and the planets were one of the ways that early civilizations could keep track of years. So they could keep track of seasons that way, because otherwise it's pretty hard to tell one day from another. And so to see a celestial body back in a spot where you're expecting it to be, and you can say definitively, hey, it's been an expected period of time. I expect the same things to be happening again. Data point. Data point. Let's, hey, someone pass me the clay. <laughs> I'm going to write it down. I'm going to squish this in that clay over there, and then we're going to bake it. And so and gonna... I guess what's kind of funny about that is if you consider how long it would take you to put together a relevant data set about the length of a year, like how many points do you need before people are like, I believe you. One year. You need one year, right? Have, so you're waiting a year, you get to put a mark on the cave wall. You wait a year, you put another mark on the cave wall. You wait a year, you put another mark in the cave wall. Like, 
in between the time before you hit statistical significance and people will pay attention to your research, you got a lot of time to make up stories <laughs> about why it is to make sure that they remember it. For sure. And that's that's mythology, right? Like that's all Mars, you know, and the planets are still named for those stories yeah. that people made up as a way to talk about this consistency that they saw in their environment. This, this amazing. Well, they're also, they just stand out as so amazing. We don't see the stars like we used to, but when you're going to sleep outside all the time and there aren't cities putting artificial light up, you were just bathed in starlight every night. Imagine a new moon, so no real moonlight on Earth, even a couple hundred years ago. Anywhere you go is the most brilliant starlight you'll ever see in your life. And Within the bathing of millions of stars that we can see in the sky, maybe we can't see millions, but a ton, a ton of stars, they're like these, there were like a handful of little dots that moved on their own. They moved special amongst the thousands and thousands of other dots that are fixed up there. What the hell is that shit? And I think it's hard to, in the modern world where we have conquered the problem that, of needing light to see... It's hard to get your head around the extent to which that's important in your life. That that bathe like you kept saying bathing, right? Like to be bathed, bathed in light, right? A baby bathed in light. I don't know if people appreciate the extent to which if you go my first experience with this was working in the dark room, where we would go in the dark room to roll film. And you know, if you're if you're taking film out of the canister and putting it slowly onto a spool and you're doing 36 spools of film like we used to, <laughs> you're in a room that is deliberately pitch black for like three hours. And I always used to notice that after that three hours, you can actually see like yeah, a little bit tiny, light tiny bit of what's going on in there. Not even enough to affect film is enough that you're like, oh, I can see the faucet where I used to be just completely blind in this darkness, right? Mm -hmm. But you think about that world, like if the sun... The moon is bright enough that after a couple hours of the sun being gone, you can see pretty well in really? the dark. Like, that's a big impact on your life if you spend your life following a herd of buffalo around and you need to know what those buffalo are doing mm -hmm. in the night. It's unfortunate how much the stars have been taken away and the view of the planets that you can see with the naked eye, of which there are a bunch. It's unfortunate how much that's been taken away from people because of artificial light. I feel like that's why we got to talk about it, man, because so. I don't think, because I don't, I think it's like the importance of public lands, <laughs> but also it's it's just going to get worse as more people spread out and want to see at night. So, so planets, oh. man. So what are they doing there, right? Like we're talking about all these cyclical forces and blah, blah, blah. And it's, we're talking about gravity, right? Like they're there because of the uniting force of the universe that we can't really explain, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> right this attraction of particles the one that makes makes you fall down when you trip right <laughs> uh the general theory about planets is that when stars are forming well rewind even a little further everything in the universe kind of just seems to be a bunch of bunch of stuff floating around and it slowly coalesces over time and it turns into something else and so and it uh, coalesces and because mass seems to attract mass. Like yeah. that's that's the theory of gravity. And it's never not happened since man has been recording this stuff. So let's go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Good summary. <laughs> right? Like mass attracts mass. And that, that holds on a like a universal scale. So stars are just a bunch of mass all packed in until it's so there's so much energy in there that it explodes. And starts this chain reaction that gets you to what we talked about in our very first episode about stellar nucleosynthesis. But while all that mo molecular like material is getting fired out of the star, it still has that impulse to stick to itself. <laughs> you know, like that yeah. attraction of mass doesn't go away, and so those particles just keep behaving the same way once they're out, and they and they then they turn into like planets and comets and asteroids and yeah all that stuff yeah. all that stuff's the same <laughs> basically is the i think the the theory i don't know what the theory name is called i ain't no astrophysicist but the the idea of a planetary disk like 
people can picture what a what a milk like what like the milky way looks like right it's a galaxy with this big disc of stuff spinning around that's just what a solar system looks like too it's just what our early solar system looked like there was a bunch of stuff floating around a star that had formed all this gas was drawn in together and it slowly collapsed into the into form a star and then there's all this dust and gas and little rocks and the little rocks would bump into each other and collide and over time some of them would stick together and over billions of years uh these little particles all piled up and you eventually you get asteroids and you get bigger rocks and then eventually you start to get planets these huge uh huge balls of like billions and billions of little rock collisions and little pieces of dust gathered here and there uh and that planetary disk of all this dirt and mess and gas uh slowly gets cleaned up and it turns into big planets that's the theory at least right they're the big chunks where you know pieces of this stuff got stuck enough together but how do we know that how do we know we these know things? we didn't know shit about planets for a You're long like, time science is bullshit well, the, <laughs> how do we try to this is this is the other piece about the Babylonians I thought was interesting. Um, we can see a bunch of planets with the naked eye, so they knew about. Uh, you can see a bunch of planets with the naked eye, which is even more appreciable in the context we talked about before, where there isn't so much light pollution, right? Like Mars is actually red. You can see that it's red. I mean, I'm talking without a telescope. You can tell that Mars is red in the night sky. I mean, even even with even in bright lights, like even in in the middle of downtown San Diego, I can see a bunch of planets. They're hugely bright, like Jupiter and Venus. You see them as some of the first stars that sort of illuminate at night because they're so bright. The idea that you can see a bunch with the naked eye, obviously, was how we first noticed that something different was going on out in the night sky. Uh, and so since the time of the Babylonians, and again, probably thousands and thousands of years before that, uh, we were able to see, uh, where'd my list just go? Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and we were standing on Earth. Not that we necessarily knew it was the same thing, um, but we could see all of those. And so for at least for 4,000 years, the last 4,000 years, we could see them with the naked eye, but we had no way to look at them otherwise. It wasn't until the 17th century, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century that we were uh, building and perfecting telescopes to let us look deeper out into into the sky. And I think like the timeline of planetary science is just this ongoing effort to try to figure out what those things are and talk about it. And so reading these like like reading what newton had to say about the planets or socrates had to say about the planets like it's fascinating because they're just going hey what if it's this and for a <laughs> long time they had no real way to like test that no way so it was just sort of like hey what if it's this and sometimes people were like we don't like that we're gonna kill you <laughs> and there's and they're so they're so bizarre too because if you're just looking at the planets with respect to where we are on planet earth they do w weird things in the sky they fly one direction and they fly back the other direction. They're all over the place. They're inconsistent with their timing. Mars isn't in the same place every year, even though our planet is. Mars is somewhere else in its orbit. And so it was this it was this this like glimpse into the fact that something else was going on. Uh something outside of the the sun and the moon seem to be like, like the dominant massively things. outside of something your something day to day world of humanness right something <laughs> massively out it's like it, to <laughs> early humans, even humans like five hundred years ago, the stars were like a television screen. It's just this flat thing that you look up at because especially if you think the earth is flat, you're literally just looking straight up at a television screen above you, and there are these things that you can see and that seem to do stuff to you. They like light things up and provide warmth, but you can't touch them. You can't see them. They don't talk to you. What the hell are they? It's If you imagine a scene, I, I, right now I'm envisioning a scene in any movie you've ever seen where someone is like transported or it turns out that they can go through their mirror or like... <laughs> So anyone passing through like a dimensional portal has the same experience of like looking at it and going, I, I'm going to try to touch it. And then your hand goes through it. Uh, like, I feel like that's what we did with space exploration, right? Like if you thought of it as a totally, screen yeah. and then you're like, let's, let's shoot something at it and see if it bounces back. Let's shoot something out there. And you do and it doesn't. Like, okay. So it goes way further than we can reach now. 
Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, the idea, I don't know. I'm going to tell when... a story about why I think that is. It'll have to do with <laughs> dragons and... and... <laughs> the, uh, the leap from these these things in the sky, these lights that we see. I mean, I don't even know what the frame of reference is for somebody thousands of years ago, right? There's no, there, what do you, I guess you have torches and stuff, right? So the torches in the sky, you're not going to say light. It's not like a light bulb that comes on at night. Like did someone light a fire in the sky? Like, is that planet a, a torch on fire? Like the frame of reference is, is just, it's impossible to appreciate because we're taught about planets so early as kids they're like you put mobiles of planets over kids cribs because we're so fascinated with the idea of like this infiniteness that we've discovered that encapsulates our tiny little world so i think the next thing to talk about is like how the enlightenment period and sort of this mass application of the scientific method to how we thought about things carried through planetary science right like we started developing these tools to continue to in spirit throw things at it and see if it bounces back <laughs> right test stuff <laughs> right i've got so, this idea let me give it a try so is that telescopes is that people writing these things down and assessing one another's and talking about it and then saying well it seems like it's more likely this well, it's a couple. I think it's a couple things with planets, right? Because you've got you've got a lot of history with planets and Earth and rotation. And are we at the center of something? Is Earth special? What's Paying the sun? What's matters, the moon? How's it, it moving? It affects whether or not your crops grow. Like right, and the sun and the 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 sun is different than the planets uh, in the sky, as is the moon, because they're very consistent. And so over the year. Uh, people recognize that this, hey, the sun, same time of year next year is in the same spot in the sky. The and planets if you can aren't. recognize that pattern, you survive better. You make yeah. more food. You don't die in the cold. Right. The Nile you... doesn't flood and destroy all your crops at a time when you're not expecting it right. to. Like there are, these, there are these interesting time period components. And so very early on, we were using the sun and the moon as a... Uh, data input like you said earlier it's data to help you help you survive um but the planets were different they were doing their own thing and so all of a sudden you have this you have this scientific pursuit where there are these things that are massively important and everyone appreciated how important they were because we built total spiritual mythologies around them um but we don't really know what they are they don't seem to really affect us they're just out there they're kind of similar to the sun and the moon so my theory is that they're out there they're just floating around us we're we're clearly the important thing here right so uh, and the idea got... of a community of scientists is everyone else goes oh, i can dig it uh, here's a way i could maybe test that right. i'm going to do it and write about it so that you can look at it and go oh that does also line up okay <laughs> well you've got you've got hundreds and i guess thousands of years of people trying to put together models that explain why the planets move the way they do in outer space because for some reason we all decided thousands of years ago that there have to be <laughs> rules about the universe and that once we discover them they stay the same which is a weird assumption we make about stuff but it seems to kind of be true well that's, um, I, that kicks back not to go down a rabbit hole of talking about the function of religion but like it religion is Religion is where you go, I think, and philosophy is the same, I feel like, is where you go for answers about things where we just can't collect data, yeah, ever. Where we just right? don't know. And There's science is about things where we've realized that we could get better at understanding this pattern to promote survival, but we started noticing those patterns because of religion, right? It's like, hey, if here's a blanket rule that you're nice to people, like everybody feels good and more people seem to survive. So everybody goes, cool, we got data points. We got That's happiness nice. and survival. Let's just follow these rules forever. And in fact, let's kill people that don't agree with our <laughs> rules. It, it, it's the same mode of thought, I think. So it's interesting, this transition we're talking about with the what they call the Enlightenment mm -hmm. in terms of historical periods, is it was sort of this transition to like, okay, I'm, I'm following your rule about be a good person. 
but over here, I think I can grow better crops or I want to go understand this stuff. But like planetary science is still interesting because you're just, you're bumping up a constantly against the threshold of what can't be tested using the mechanism. So it right. almost, so every conversation is almost spiritual in the sense of like, you have to own that we're going to try as hard as we can to apply the scientific method to the exploration right. of the outer reaches of our knowledge set. But I, it's not, I'm never really going to find an answer that makes me go like, fuck yeah, I got it. I'm done here. <laughs> well, that's what's so interesting about uh, space and stuff that we look at up in the sky. For the most part, we're just, we're making it all up because we're not there. We're not on these planets. We have very recently in human history started to send things out to planets. We've landed on planets. We've landed on the moon. We've put a person on the moon. Holy shit. <laughs> we put a, we sent a person out there and he walked around a bunch of them. They rode a golf cart out on the moon. a golf cart around. Um, but for the most part, for almost all of human history, we were just looking at these things. Again, it's, it, we were just looking at TV and noticing that TV seemed to have some sort of powerful impact on us as TV in the sky and trying to formulate models and reasons like, what is this stuff out there? What is it? What are we doing? What's it? What's it doing? Why is it there? I keep envisioning the the scene in Truman Show where he's on his boat and then the boat just goes <laughs> through like yeah, a big right piece of paper, you know, like uh, we are it. At any time, we could try to send a probe to somewhere, and it could just hit a solid barrier. And then, totally. what the f what the fuck do we make of our universe? Right. <laughs> and and we haven't gone very far, so we can kind of get to that as we leave our solar system here on this exploration of planets. We'll save that, but we just haven't gone very far. So, I, back to what your original your question of like what was going on around the enlightenment i think it was two things one we were mathematically more inclined we had we've discovered and created new mathematics that were allowing us to look at the planetary motion in different ways and let us kind of uncover that it wasn't this like wild crazy movement we kind of realized what was going on and we also uh started to started to build telescopes which i don't know <clears throat> how many people listening have ever looked at uh well the moon through a telescope is neat but you can kind of see some features on the moon with the naked eye but if you ever looked at saturn through a telescope when it goes from being a dot to a, a planet with rings around it it floors you i almost passed out the first time i i looked at saturn through a telescope and you have to understand we have telescopes that are powerful enough that it's like where it's the imagery that comes out of them is I think probably boring to the average person because right now they're focusing on giant fields of like, let's just take a look at this little inch of space and see how many galaxies there are in there. But like, if you were to take that telescope and point it at the moon, you can see the moon as well as I can see the cat out my back window with a decent pair of binoculars, <laughs> right? Where you're just like, oh, fuck, I'm watching a person and it's right up in my shit. Like, you do that with the moon. Yeah. Right? So I guess uh, kind of what I'm chasing is this idea. I mean, there's two things, I think, to pay attention to in there, which is one, you said mathematical models, right? So we figured out that math seemed to have a consistency to it as well. And we started trying to apply math to the physical things that we were also telling stories about, right? So it was like, let's use this tool, math, to talk about these patterns over here because it's really important that we understand these particular patterns because it's how we survive right crops all that stuff right back to that point and that's like what physics and calculus are right like really high level math that i think a lot of people don't experience in their life because you don't need it in day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. is to be used to figure out really complicated physical phenomena that's really important to know because computers are really good at math yeah so I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of talking about what the implication of computers on all this stuff, but it's a thing no. to think about, right? We're staying in the natural world. Everything we usually talk about with computers in the world. has implications in our in in this in the in the in the exploration of Absolutely. 
this kind of science. Otherwise, we've been doing a lot of stuff that is essentially what a telescope does. So a telescope is just, we, we talked about this actually at length in our second or third episode when we talked about camera lenses, right? A telescope is just a giant lens. Mm -hmm. And a lens is just a tool for collecting light and making it consumable in a different format. <laughs> the same way you like convert a file on your computer. Well, well, so, so a telescope is just a way of being like, okay, we've built a device that reliably recreates what's actually out there. Now we're going to use it to look at things and see what we can figure out. Yeah. It's no different than the process we were talking about earlier with the Babylonians talking about what they see. Yeah, yeah your camera is just a telescope. And so we're looking closer, and then the rest of the community, as we go, hey, I got some more data, is running through all the other things that we figured out through these thousands and thousands of years of figuring out systems for this and applying you know, data-based things and the scientific method and a, and a, you know, a rigorous approach to <laughs> exploration of ideas. We're going, oh, you got some light beams off of that planet? I'm going to look at them, right? And so this is how we know these things about all these planets really far away. It's because we're analyzing the light that comes from them. And we're actually able to tell all kinds of really, really specific, really cool things. Well, I think the fun thing with planets is that... Uh, well, one, we live on one, so we have a frame of reference. You know, we've, we've, we know a lot about ours. We've been here. We've dug around in the dirt. We've played with things that are growing here. Uh, we've thrown footballs around and see how they fly. We've experienced tornadoes and hurricanes and how the sun rises and how water flows, right? So we've, like, we've done, every, we've done all this stuff this in the context of our This is why sports are important. Um, it's back that's, to sports. That's why sports this, are this important. That's why sports are important. <laughs> <laughs> because um, people... Like, we made a game out of testing gravity on a consistent basis yeah. for how, reward. How well... I used to <laughs> I used to have an argument. Maybe this wasn't an argument. It was just, it was just like, something we had both read differently. But uh, the, the argument was, if we went to the moon and we tried to play catch, would you be able to catch the ball I throw at you? Or would your brain be unable to adapt to the new gravitational the different gravitational field that would be on the moon would you would you be like so locked into how gravity works on earth that i'd throw the football and you'd always miss miscalculate where it goes at least for a, a period of time uh, it's the random number generator so we created a high value random number generator that tests that hypothesis on an <laughs> ongoing basis a football has never failed to travel <laughs> the way that we thought that it would and we keep yeah. raising the stakes it's worth more and more money to be really good at throwing a football like no baseball's idea. curve in midair and stuff like they do weird things and people get paid really good money to keep trying to make it do a weird thing so the <laughs> other person can't hit it and they totally. can't outside of a certain parameter which is probably why baseball's gotten to be kind of boring <laughs> like things don't happen in baseball where I'm like, how did he do that <laughs> anymore? Baseball's the biggest physics test of all time. <laughs> and it continues to prove prove that uh, gravity gravity functions in a certain uh -huh. way. So before we before we venture out in into space to visit the other planets, uh, I just you I mean think within it's the podcast. Uh, yeah, like within within our own mental mental imaginations within the imagination zone on through the podcast um before we do that i just i think it's important to talk about like what we know about our own planet and how we know it uh and when you we know a, we know a lot about what's going on on the surface of our planet because we live here and we can roam around and explore things but when you start to think about how difficult it has been for us to even like get to the top of mountains and to invent planes to fly around in the atmosphere uh, and to drill for oil, uh, we just don't know that much about our planet as a big thing that's floating around in outer space. Like we've measured, we've me it's not that we don't know a lot, but we haven't like, there's always the difference in scientific discovery, I think, as a human between like kind of knowing something, having like tested it and done the science and predicted it with math and like having physically touched it and seen it and and proven to ourselves as an adventurous species that it is the way we've said it is. And I think that's always the boundary. That's like the barrier for, for everyone. When we look at science, it's like, well, 
uh, yeah, math says this thing is happening, but like, I can't see it. We'll never get there in my lifetime. So there's always this little barrier with that. And on the sense of our planet, planet Earth, as a celestial body, like we haven't been inside of it very deep. We can't even drill through the crust of it. We've been trying for a hundred years. And so all of our uh, mathematical and scientific models about like how the planet works, they're scientific theories. They're our best guesses about what's going. We don't know what's in the middle of our planet. We have good but, guesses. But then the problem with theory is it's too broad an application for what you would call that, right? Which is why when you start talking about like logic as a thing, like we did with Mike last week, you start talking about axioms and postulates and there's all kinds of weird other words <laughs> for the gradient between uh, of a theory. It's still called a theory, right? That's why it's the theory of gravity. Right. But there's this gradient, right? Like we were just talking about football. We really, really understand that gravity is it's a thing. It's not going anywhere. It has a consistency to it to the point that we do football and mm -hmm. without gravity, football wouldn't be a thing. Like it's football is of social value because it's an ongoing test of all mm -hmm. kinds of relevant tools: statistical yeah. analysis, scientific exploration. <laughs> like anyway, so when you say the theory of gravity, it, it, it fucking exists. It's a real thing. Don't use the word theory against me to refute what we're saying. On the other side. We can only get so far into the earth before what we're poking in there fucking melts. <laughs> like it just becomes right. part of the mass of goo that's and in the middle just, of our planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's far and it's big. The planet is like four thousand miles across. And so that's to drill a data a point, the right? Side we just can't explore. get any further because it's like, well, after that, everything we stick into it melts. And it's hot. <laughs> we don't know if every planet's hot. We're trying to find out by sending things to them and drilling. Right. And so we we guess because currently our maximum drill depth on other planets is like an inch. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> um, the, uh, so yeah, we have a buddy that worked on that drill, didn't he? Um, we have a buddy who I think the laser, the laser drill is what he was talking about last time I talked yeah, to him. Who was that? I, he doesn't want his name spoken on the podcast. Oh, was that the same person? Yeah. Um, that would make sense because I think that's where that whole project happens. <clears throat> well, that's what's fun about science. I we're think we're literally trying to poke holes. Like we're we uh we make these predictions about stuff, kind of knowing that they're not gonna be completely right. And just over and over again, we get to have this excitement of, oh my god, it's different than we thought it was, and that has happened over and over and over again as we've explored out into the universe and specifically out into our solar system, which I think is where the, the ship is going to go now. Yeah, I was just chasing an understanding of like the force that motivates our continuing to look into it is not just like, oh, there's curious people. Like, yeah, there's a lot of curious people, but those people are curious because they have it in their soul to try to survive. Like... <laughs> And so they're like, I need to know more about this thing so I can make this decision better. There's just a very uh, long standing history of exploration resulting in reward, you know, discovery uh, and wealth and power no and variety. space and land and uh, all kinds of things. Right. And so whatever your uh, judgment is of those various things, um, it just seems to be a, a truth about humans exploring. So the more we explore, the more uh, we will discover, the more we'll accomplish. I think it's just a, I think it's a function of any form of life that we have thus found in the universe. That, wow. I didn't mean to jump off that cliff. <laughs> different, different <laughs> cast for sure. Yeah, that goes a lot of places. <laughs> I just blew my own mind and then got lost. <laughs> um, but I so, think humans are motivated to explore for other life. Humans want to find of, other humans, essentially. I mean, it's the best we could do scientifically is to see if the variables that we've yeah. observed here stack up anywhere else. Right. It's the only thing that's reasonable to expect, right? We haven't, there aren't creatures running around on the surface of the moon. 
So we wouldn't expect there to be creatures on other planetary bodies that look like the moon. It's the only thing we got any data for. Right. But what we've discovered on our own planet, though, is that literally every single place we've ever looked, we've found things living Uh, everywhere that we wouldn't expect them to. uh, We find things living and thriving. Um, And so it, uh, it excites me at the prospect of probably finding life on every planetary body in the entire galaxy as far as i'm concerned i think we'll find it but that's kind of a different well i guess what is interesting about it is to me the extent to which what we were looking for when we go hey what's on venus is in a sense it's like oh it's too cold we can't put a person (laughs) there or they'll die okay so here's how we can continue to poke at that thing send cameras by it You know, we could maybe get a robot there and look around. But, like, if we send a person there, that'll be kind of (laughs) rough. You know? That person won't last very long. And there's probably not any new crops to bring back. And so we've come up with these tools for assessing these baseline pieces that humans need to survive. What's the atmosphere made of? What's the rock made of? What's... what, What are... What math can we do to figure out the state of gravity as we understand it on this mass? Um, and so we're constantly looking for all those things, sort of, to understand what the next step in continued exploration would be. Mm-hmm. And that's how we get to, like, what what is what does Venus look like? I don't, I honestly, for all my stoke about space, I don't know that I could name the planets in order in the solar system right now. It's a thing I had to memorize in the past. I'm kind of aware of them, but I would look it up to make sure if I had to refer to it in a, in a research paper right now. I would be nervous saying it. I think I know them, but uh, Mercury the closest. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I'm literally sweating that. You can always check because you can always get a little check on the inner planets. Because of the popular television show, Third Rock from the Sun. Oh, yeah. So at least so, you know that you've got to hit the third. That, <laughs> you know you know, number three is planet is, is home base. Okay, um, so so then <clears throat> never mind our solar system, which is one of those... It's just funny that I can't even name the planets anymore because it's so filed away as... Uh, okay, here's what I need to know from that to extrapolate to cooler things. I'm going to file it away and look it up later. So... The next piece to understand past that is relative to the variables that we observe here and the patterns that we're looking for to support what we would what we call life. There's this idea of the habitable zone, right? Which is the point in a solar system where there could maybe be life. But yes, what makes the, that habitable? I, guess. I think the gen. I mean, there there's a lot of stuff that's going on with Earth that makes it habitable, like a ton of things. Uh, But one of the big things that is usually referenced first is the idea that there's liquid water here. We, our planet exists in a spot where it's close enough to the sun that all the water hasn't evaporated or been like washed away by the power of the sun. Um, And it's not far enough away that all the, all the water's frozen. Or frozen, yeah, exactly. Frozen into an unusable molecular form. It's kind of floating. It's like floating in an area in space around our star around the sun where the sun like just kind of heats the planet just right um and and there's a lot of other stuff at play there also but that concept is really important to humans and to life as we know it these living things on earth all re all depend dramatically uh on h2o on water on that molecule is really important for the functioning of every bit of life on earth. Um, people recognize that that doesn't mean that life can not exist other ways, but it's the only thing we've ever found in the universe. And it's so complicated. Life on earth is so complex that it seems ridiculous for us to like make up other forms of life that could have, could become into existence. Cause we don't even know how we came into existence. There just is life on earth all of a sudden, and we don't know where it came from. So the, uh, the habitable zone is kind of this zone in the solar system where a planet can exist and support life as we know it. And the Earth, obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, the Earth happens to be in our star's habitable zone. Uh, Mercury, Venus, they're too close. Um, Saturn and Jupiter, other problems with them as well, but they're too far away. Pluto, for instance, it's it's cold, it's dark, There's you know? And so 
What's interesting in our solar system is that Earth is not the only planet in the habitable zone. Mars is also in the habitable zone. Uh, Mars happens to be a desolate wasteland as far as we can tell these days, but there are all kinds of uh, indications that it at some point had a more active surface, that it had things flowing on it, and it potentially had water. It has water on its on its polar regions. There is ice. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of a lot of hope. I think that at some point Mars, Mars could have been a planet sustaining life long before Earth was, and Earth and life could have transferred here. You know, there's there's so there are interesting implications when you look at. It's so hard not to go time. off the cliff when you talk about geological time into a space that's just like because uh, <laughs> it you know where you lose people if you're trying to talk about it because it's just like the scale of trying to understand that a whole planet could have <clears throat> happened start to finish. Yeah including life of a scale that we don't understand absolutely before our planet even started to happen as the thing well is so it's so let's reference makes me feel so small it's, it's so <laughs> it's, I, I find geological time to be such a incredibly interesting uh framework to think about uh not only one's own life um but also to think about the universe and because it's so grand and because when you start to look at these uh epics epochs uh of time these these eras uh, granulated periods of time on earth when certain things were going on like when the dinosaurs the quote unquote dinosaurs were around or before there was life on earth you get these these striated time periods where there were like there were there was a billion years that the earth was just a big rock essentially i mean there were volcanoes and and stuff going on but there was no living rock. there was nothing yeah. alive <laughs> there was no soil there was no was... there was no dirt like the brown dirt that you go touch that didn't exist because that's dead living stuff there was just like sand and rock right and so um what you were just saying is totally correct mars could have sustained life for hundreds of millions of years for billions of years uh, there could have been intelligent creatures vastly more intelligent than us doing things on Mars. And over a billion years, the planet shifts so dramatically. Anything could have happened. Um, so there, there is there's this, this crazy mystery about humanity and it being on planets because we've existed for such a tremendously short period of time. And it's just, it's seemingly just a coincidence that uh, something happened to monkeys a million years ago, something enabled them to become intelligent like we are because a monk, a, 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 an ape or a squirrel or a hippopotamus or a T-Rex, they're kind of all essentially the same level of complexity. They've all got brains and tiny arms and legs and they eat stuff and they run around and they reproduce. And that shit's existed for hundreds of millions of years like that. And it was just a coincidence that something triggered us to grow a bigger brain and build spaceships. And for whatever reason, for me, that makes me feel like, I think that's so cool. And I feel happy about the existence of what, like about the fact of what you were just saying <laughs> while fully understanding why it's so terrifying, right? Like it's just this void of ununderstandable stuff. And the conversation we're having is just our kind of like just flicking at it to make sure it doesn't explode. But like, the impulse to explore that stuff is so rooted in like this idea of a habitable zone, right? There are habitable zones on our planet. They're places where people can't live. We found the habitable zones of our <laughs> planet and we're slowly filling them with people. It's like, tiny and it's just this little band of like... Not too close to the river. Sometimes it floods. <laughs> close yeah, enough to the river that we can get water. Not only is it is it granular like that, but if you look at the whole planet... We can only this this huge big sphere. We can only live in this tiny little ring around the edge. We can't live up in the sky. There's not enough oxygen. It gets really cold. We can't live below ground. It gets really hot and it's hard to get down there. So we live in this tiny little this tiny little ring around the planet that's almost imperceptible when you I look wish at you had a, video a right now because you're doing what you're doing with your fingers is trying to get this little tiny pinchy line. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's spectacular of all the places in the whole universe that we've ever looked at or discovered it's just that tiny little 
thin line that circles our planet where we as human beings can exist. We die everywhere else without artificial means to sustain us. But so what's cool on top of that, and I think that's what starts to wind this whole thing down, I, we're using science and tools to know things about other planets, and it's all motivated by looking for this little strip of some of these places where it's like... There's just, there's so many reasons that people talk about for traveling to other planets, but I think the real fundamental one for me personally, and I think kind of underlying for everybody is... Uh, it gets us a little closer to answering the big question of what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> but and how did we get here? And as we go out and look at these things, we, we're discovering stuff and we're discovering it's kind of, it's kind of nonsense. It's this weird magic nonsense layer that science keeps diving deeper and deeper into. Like there's, we're in a galaxy and it's, it's billions of miles across and there are hundreds of millions of other planets and that galaxy is just one of billions of other galaxies. Like what the hell, what the hell is that? That's meaningless nonsense on some level. Um, but it, it's driving, it's, it's giving us something to strive for. It's like a game. This comes back to, to our AI and VR conversations. It's a game that has an endlessly generated environment that as we continue to discover things, it creates new things for us to then continue to discover. We, yeah, and we're actually going to do a separate episode with this on Alan, uh, with Alan on uh, what you just described in computational terms. It's called procedurally generated content. <laughs> we're actually going to do a whole separate episode where we talk about that with uh, Alan, who was a, a guest a few episodes ago. But yeah, well, like, but I think that's why. For me, I don't see the way that I learned to think in philosophy class as any different from it's just it's just a piece of getting to and using the scientific method. And what's so cool about planets to me and everything that has to do with, you know, space science is it it's always bumping up against the edge. I think I've said this earlier, but it's 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 always bumping up against the edge of and then uh, we don't know. <laughs> And so it's like you, you were just talking about, you know, you're, like, you're chasing this thing, but that magic layer, as far as we've experienced so far, like doesn't go away. And so you're still constantly in this world of theoretical, like you're trying to come up with an answer, you're trying to test it to see if it holds, but you also have to live with the fact that you just might never find it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's like, I don't know, a metaphor That's for life. Big. <laughs> That's like the uh, <clears throat> whenever if you watch science documentaries that kind of follow discoveries, that's always the hook in the in the documentary. It's like, hey, we're following these scientists or these adventurers. They're climbing a mountain or they're uncovering a lost city or they're in search of the Higgs boson. And the hook in the movie, the like the plot line that keeps you engaged is, oh, my God, are they going to get the thing they're hoping to they to get are they gonna get to the top are they gonna uncover the city are they gonna find this new thing and prove this old theory that we've been banking on for centuries and that That's makes me feel better about the world because that like <laughs> like people <laughs> like our heroes in popular culture all the way back to explaining this what you saw in the night sky with myths are explorers and they're and they're they're chasing new ideas constantly. And the people that make a lot of money are chasing new ideas and mm -hmm. like problem solving and the people that you know about. And it's just, I think it's just happening more and more. Like it makes other people feel good just to hear a story about mm -hmm. someone else's exploration. Like yeah. it's that far rooted in making people like, like people just feel, feel happier when they're exploring or they're hearing we stories about explorers or they're solving conflict or they made it. Like, I, think I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> alive. Neither of us were alive for, uh, the space program in the sixties. Uh, the attempt of humanity to put a person on the moon and it was kicked off because of, uh, the cold war, this race between Russia and the U S 
to kind of outcompete each other. And there's a lot of theories as to like why why we were doing this and that and why we did this in particular. But this race to adapt weapons that we had created for World War, uh, to adapt them to space travel, to refocus the efforts of creating nuclear weapons that we can fire around the globe, to repurpose those same rockets to put a person on the moon. I can't, I mean, I'm getting choked up talking about it here. (laughs) I can't imagine what that felt like to the whole planet when humanity landed on a foreign body and a person hopped out and seemingly floated down a ladder onto something that we as humans had been looking at for millions of years and we as creatures no doubt other animals have been staring up at the moon for hundreds of millions of years and we got there and as far as we can tell from all of our paying attention to the patterns in this system is that we wouldn't even be here without the moon we absolutely like, would not the be moon here without the causes the tides and the tides are really important for all manner of geological things so the never mind just the so sun, things for just us. the closest celestial body to us mm-hmm. that we've actually walked around on now <laughs> is vital enough to our surviving that it may be that all these planets we find in the habitable zone, of which we have recently, to many people's excitement, found thousands and thousands and thousands in the space that we can see with the telescopes that we were talking about before. So we can actually sample the reality of that light coming off those planets and say, okay, unless it turns out it's a screen and we punch through it one day, there's stuff out there in the zone where maybe there's life. But also we got weird little thing like, eh, some of them have moons and some don't. So if it turns out the moon is the crux thing that has to happen for life to exist, then now thousands of those planets are off limits because they don't have the moon and the tide and this motion of water, this organic motion of water through the system. Well, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I I know my own personal opinion on how I feel about discovering life other places, but a lot of people, when they're discussing the side of, um, why haven't we found life other places? They look at the unbelievable number of things that happen on earth here, uh, that are required for us to be alive and they're big ones. And they're big ones that I think we're going to get to in part two of this series on planets. Um, that are huge. They're driven by the fact that the Earth is a giant ball of material that's spinning in outer space and that has other things spinning around it and that's warmed by bodies nearby and that's warmed from the inside. And and so there are these huge, huge features that we never would have imagined a uh, hundred years ago had these effects and they're wildly important. And so as we look out, as we start to travel, as we travel to the other planets in the next episode... Um, we get to look at all these features of planets that make them so incredible and unique and different and varying. And it all exists in that time scale, right? It's like I, the note I wrote down earlier that I was like, I'm going to come back to this was just the idea of frame of reference. Like when you, if you stand in one place on the earth and you try to watch the sun move, you can't really see it. <laughs> You look away, you look back, it's in a different place. Like, that's the scale of our perception of the universe. But all of that stuff up there is moving so fast that if it were a a baseball on the Earth, it would just disintegrate. Like, it's it (laughs) hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. Right, like like speed that speed and time scales that it's just so hard to get your head around. And I guess I feel like that kind of applies to everything. Like there's a lesson for life in that fact of frame of reference, right? Like to try to reframe, to think about the planets is almost like a valuable exercise in trying to get your head around a thing you know you're not going to ever be able to understand and you're just going to have to deal with this sort of level (laughs) of uneasiness where you're like, okay, but let's talk about it anyway. (laughs) And it's the same with every complicated conversation in life like you just got to do the best you can and and live with the uneasiness <laughs> <laughs> that's that pretty much describes every day for me <laughs> deal with it as best you can and, and just sort of deal with the easiness sweep the sweep, uh, sweep the uneasiness under the carpet for a little while but the fact of how happy 
exploration seems to make people just as like a thing that we do and the government should keep putting money toward and things like that. I don't even care if we find anything. People just seem to be really happy and generally satisfied as a society when they continue to explore things. So yeah, keep that up. Go make some stuff or look at some stuff and have thoughts. (laughs) We got to keep exploring. Talk to other people about thoughts. Keep talking to us. We love talking to you guys about this stuff. Um, So in, uh, in this episode, we kind of dove into uh, our perception here on Earth, on our own planet, a little bit into our space. I think we're probably going to hit up our solar system and our own planets and the features of our planets in the next episode. And then if we, if we make it, maybe even a third episode where we really start to explore out into what we know about planets other places. And I think... I think that brings us back to the stoke about something like Trappist um, yeah. and the seven new planets, which we, we kind of twinkled. We kind of, we tickled in that, that shorter one. God. But, what but, if we, <laughs> what if we discovered life on another planet while we're still doing our podcast? Can we just do an episode where we like cry and we, scream for an hour? We pretend that we, <laughs> yeah, where we, we have, I, I think there's going to be no way to avoid the existential crises that both Life's of us will news. have. <laughs> We'll be broadcasting live, live if streaming. I, yeah, if I get reaction. a tweet about life on other planets while we're working on this, we may just broadcast until we're finished <laughs> talking. Oh, man. But uh, thanks for hanging out for another one. As always, special thanks to our Patreon backers who throw us as little as a buck an episode to help keep this thing afloat. One day we'll get it under a buck. Right now, that's just the lowest you could get it without all the fees and stuff adding up to. It's useless. Someday we'll accept Bitcoin and then you can just Ooh, Bitcoin give us fractions of cents. If you want to know more about that, listen to episode 22 where we talked about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and things. We did? We did. It's oh, excellent. But also find us on Facebook, Instagram, all the places. And uh, it's just another place to talk to us if that's where you hang out anyway. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. Don't forget to put warm socks on when you wake up tomorrow. Oh, warm feet is nice. Uh, nine out of ten, doing great. <laughs> nine out of ten, would listen again. It's a NASA thing. Outstanding. <laughs>